Hello, MaraiZilla here. Welcome to the addendum to my last video, the Polaris Conundrum. In this video, I shall be looking at a claim made by Fake Clouds in Sky in response to my pointing out to him that his picture contained motion blur. Fake Clouds in Sky contends that his conjecture is that, if the Earth is orbiting the Sun, then any time lapse photograph of the stars should contain motion blur, not only from the Earth's rotation, but also from the motion of the Earth as it orbits the Sun, which should make for a very messy photograph. To quote them, I mean there are two movements, the Earth rotating and then the Earth moving around the Sun. Therefore the stars in the background would create two motion blurs giving you a shit picture. He then goes on to say, try it yourself as you seem to like experiments. Get a camera set it to long exposure, now snap, spin it around and then run around in a circle. And asserts that they've already done stuff like this at art college at night with street lights. Makes cool pictures, but just a blurred mess of light. You won't get a perfect motion blurred picture like you see with the stars. Well, this seems like a very fair conjecture to anybody who hasn't got the first clue about reality. So let's examine Fake Clouds in the Sky's conjecture and see how it holds up to reality and where and why it fails miserably. The main problem with this conjecture is that they don't understand the concept of parallax. This is a simple phenomenon that is easily demonstrable to anyone who's ever sat in a moving vehicle and looked out of the window. Objects in the foreground whiz past whereas objects in the background appear to move less. The apparent motion of an object relative to you is a function of your distance to the object. The further away an object is, the less it appears to move. Now, there's a simple equation we can use to determine the angular size of the distance that an object appears to move relative to you, and thus how much blur you should experience from a prolonged exposure. It's the simple parallax equation. D equals m over 2 all over the tangent of a over 2 where d is the distance to the object, m is the distance from the observer's start point and end point, and a is the angular size of the difference in the apparent position of the object being observed. We can rearrange this formula to find the angular size of the blur we expect to see in the photograph. a equals 2 times the arctan of m over 2 over d. Now let's put an observer somewhere where they can experience 24 hours of night time so that they can take a prolonged photograph depicting a full rotation of the stars in the night sky, say, the Arctic Circle during the height of winter. The distance along its orbit that the Earth travels in one day, with a speed of around 108 km per hour, is 2,592,000 km. The closest star to Earth is Proxima Centauri, at four light years away which is 37,842,113,600,000 kilometers. Now before any astronomers and astrophysicists have a heart attack here, I know that Proxima Centauri isn't visible from the Northern Hemisphere, and every star visible from the Arctic Circle is much further away than four light years, but I'm trying to give fake clouds in sky every chance possible for their conjecture to be true. I'm literally being as charitable as I possibly can be here. So let's plug in the numbers. 2,592,000 km divided by 2 is 1,296,000 km. Divide this by 37,842,113,600,000, find the arc tangent of the solution of that, and multiply this by 2. And we find that the angular difference of the star's apparent position in the sky between our start point and end point to be roughly 0.000004 degrees, or 0.0144 arc seconds. So I'm intrigued as to why this particular flat earth proponent believes they should be able to observe a motion blur with an angular size less than 0.000005 degrees, and we're only talking about a star that's just 4 light years away. For stars 50 light years away, which would be 473 trillion 26 billion 420 million kilometers away, the angular size of the motion blur observed in a day long exposure would be about 0.000003 degrees, or about 0.001 arc seconds. For stars 100 light years away, which would be 946 trillion. 52 billion 840 million kilometers away, the angular size of the motion blur observed in a day long exposure would be about 0.000016 degrees, 
or about 0.0006 mark seconds. If that seems like a very small number, that's because it is. It's the equivalent of looking at a period at the end of a sentence from over 179 kilometers away. So again, I'm amazed by why this flat earther believes they should be able to observe any motion blur in the stars due to the Earth's orbit from a single day-long exposure. Clearly, this is yet another example of a flat earther demanding that reality should break all the physical laws just to save their complete ignorance of that reality. This inability to understand scale and simple trigonometry is endemic in the flat earth community. For another example of this strange phenomenon regarding flat earthers and their complete disregard for scale, let's see what YouTuber Chris W thought was a great argument against a round earth regarding shadows at sunset. Chris W seems to be under the impression with this experiment that come sunrise and sunset, we should see our shadows running off into space and not on the ground behind us. Well Chris, let's see where you've gone wrong here, shall we? Assuming your ball has roughly twice the radius of a standard soccer ball, then it has a radius of 22.28 centimeters. It's difficult to tell scale from this video you've used, but this would seem a fair guess. To calculate the scale, we divide this by the radius of the Earth in centimeters, 637,100,000, and then multiply that number by the height of whatever object we are measuring. At this scale, an average human being standing 1.7 meters tall is a mere 59.4 nanometers high, or 0.0000594 centimeters. The object you've used on the ball to prove your case would be the equivalent of an object at least around 286 kilometers high, assuming it is one centimeter large. Again, a fair guess given the scale evident in your video. Hmm, what object on Earth is around 286 kilometers high? Even Mount Everest is only 8.8 .8 kilometers high, yet you somehow believe you can extrapolate from your <coughs> experiment. So what does this have to do with Chris W's conjecture? Well, very simply, human beings and their buildings, along with pretty much everything else on Earth, will experience their shadows being overridden by the shadow of the Earth itself by the time they experience their shadows running off into space as the vector of the sun to the person or building reaches a tangent to the Earth. We can demonstrate this with a very simple experiment. If we have a large object on a ball, then we don't have to rotate the ball very far before we see its shadow appear on a plane behind the ball. If we have a shorter object, then we have to rotate the ball further until the shadow appears on the plane behind the ball. What does this show us? The smaller the object, then the more we have to rotate the ball, and the closer that object has to approach the shadow of the ball, until we see its shadow appear on a plane behind the ball, and therefore running off into space. With sufficiently small objects, we won't notice the shadow of the object appearing on the plane behind the ball before it is overwhelmed by the ball's shadow itself. Look, if you want to prove your point, Chris, either you need a much bigger ball to allow for the scale, or you need to substitute your relative mega colossus for something 59.4 nanometers high. Your inability to understand the simple concept of scale is nothing short of astounding. Also notice how you should always see shadow on the ground behind you until it merges with the shadow of the Earth. So no, Chris, we shouldn't expect to see our shadows disappearing into space. Reality, I'm afraid, is not required to warp itself insanely and break all the laws of mathematics and physics just to sate the idiotic musings of the geometrically impaired. Do I really have to walk grown adults through this? Is the word tangent not in your dictionary? Finally, let's take a look at a conjecture put forward by YouTube commentator Goldie Sunshine in response to the motion of the pole stars. <laughs> Goldie Sunshine fails to realize an important point, that the pole stars each rotate around a central point. Neither pole star is observed moving laterally to the horizon, otherwise it would look like this. Or even like this. However, someone in Australia sees something more like this.
and someone in South America sees something more like this. And someone in South Africa sees something more like this. In fact, everywhere you go in the Southern Hemisphere, you see something more like this. And not this. Or this. I mean seriously, is there any way that I can make it clearer before I'm forced to concede that this flat earth proponent has demonstrably lost all ability to comprehend reality? Now there is a fundamental theme running through all the flat earth claims I've encountered so far. That is that they display an inability, or purposeful unwillingness, to understand the model they are arguing against. The problem is that, whether you agree with a model or not, in order to debunk it, you have to address that model, otherwise all you're doing is creating a straw man and arguing against that. It's the equivalent of me suggesting that if the world was a flat disk of radius 5 kilometers, then why don't I walk off the edge when I leave the city center? And the fact that I don't means that I've just debunked the flat earth conjecture. At this, the flat earth community would be rightly up in arms at the fact that this isn't the model they are proposing and thus my argument hasn't actually debunked their conjecture at all. This is why I don't argue that ships should fall off the edge of a flat earth, because this isn't the model they propose, and thus it would be intellectually dishonest of me to attack this straw man argument. However, this is exactly what flat earthers continually do in making their arguments as evidenced from these examples and more. So flat earthers, if you want to make an argument against the actual heliocentric spheroidal Earth model that is proposed, then you need to start realizing that you have to make arguments against the actual heliocentric spheroidal Earth model that is proposed, and not some version of it you've dreamt up, either because you don't know what the actual model is and says, or because you're purposefully misrepresenting it. When I address the points you make, I shall always do my best to address the actual points you make and the models you propose, and where I make a mistake in this regard, I shall endeavour to publicly correct myself and address your points correctly. It would be nice if some of the hardline Flat Earth community had the intellectual integrity to do the same. Remember, intellectual integrity, it's a virtue, not an obstacle. As we go through this series, we shall continue to examine the asinine claims put forth by those sections of our society who lack the mental capacity to critically analyse the evidence around them, and discover why simple geometry, mathematics and physics are all we need to realise that we do, indeed, live on a spheroidal earth. Thanks for watching. As a postscript to this video, I just want to highlight Fake Clouds in Sky's approach to debating the shape of the Earth, as a typical response from someone in the hardline Flat Earth community. They began by making a claim based on what they believed to be scientific evidence. Once it was proved to them why their supposed evidence didn't support their conjecture, and were given the mathematics and physics to explain this, instead of producing their own mathematics or physics to rebut this, they proclaimed that I should go into space and take a picture. This line of argument failed on several points. Firstly, physics, mathematics and geometry don't magically stop working whenever it is convenient for fake clouds in skies frankly moronic worldview. Secondly, as they themselves have admitted, they are willing to discount any photographic evidence as being faked, therefore it doesn't matter even if I did go into space and take a picture. This exposes the disingenuous nature of their attempting to move the goalposts. 
no matter what evidence they are provided with, they will not accept it. But most of all, fake clouds in sky has undermined their own original argument. If science and mathematics don't matter when it comes to verifying the shape of the Earth, for whatever idiotic reason you want to come up with, then fake clouds in sky's photo itself cannot be accepted, even by them, as evidence against a heliocentric spheroidal model of the Earth. Listen, fake clouds in sky, when your argument lacks consistency and even undermines itself, I don't need to refute it. You refute yourself. And when everything is stripped away and all you have is the furtive fallacy, you have no argument. So given your apparent ineptitude to form a coherent thought, I am somehow less than confident in your ability to live up to your promise of making a video to rebut my channel. In fact, I doubt even a five-year-old would find you a formidable intellectual opponent.